Mm -hmm. and going to the Chick who works here and sure. then, uh, kind of just bring it to work at Forty Six. Sure. Since becoming president of the Ford Foundation, you've been tackling inequality. Uh, I'm wondering how you would define inequality and how you came to see it as the defining social problem of our time. Well, inequality is the defining social problem of our time because inequality is harmful to hope. Inequality makes hope, makes opportunity less a reality and with inequality comes hopelessness. A growing sense of a lack of opportunity, which leads in a democracy to behaviors by the citizenry that are ultimately harmful to that very democracy. And so we believe at the Ford Foundation, because our mission is in part to strengthen and promote democracy, that inequality is our harm. So a few years ago, you released a book called From Generosity to Justice. I'm wondering what motivated you to write it, and what does it mean to move from generosity to justice? I learned about American philanthropy first by reading Andrew Carnegie's seminal essay, his 1889 Gospel of Wealth, in which he outlined the contours of American philanthropy, what men like himself should do with their wealth. He talked about charity, generosity. He talked about uh, religious reasons, moral reasons for giving. I was also inspired many years later by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, which he wrote in 1968 about philanthropy. About philanthropy, Dr. King in 1968 said the following, philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. So what Dr. King was saying was something in contrast to Carnegie's words. He was saying that yes, generosity and charity are important and necessary, but not enough. Dr. King said that the work of philanthropy must be about dignity and justice, not just charity and generosity. As the person at the top deciding what causes to prioritize, what goes through your mind? It strikes me as this gigantic, almost existential dilemma. What goes through my mind leading the Ford Foundation is my accountability and responsibility to the mission, to the demands of our time, to being effective and relevant and having impact ultimately. And what are the pathways to impact? How does one think about strengthening democracy sitting here at the Ford Foundation? You made a point of discussing how your early years continue to shape your work today. I'd love to hear how you would describe your childhood. I was very, very lucky. I lived as a boy in a country that believed in my potential. I was born in a small town in Louisiana in a charity hospital. My mother fortunately moved my sister and myself to a small community in Liberty County, East Texas. A town called Ames, Texas it had about a thousand people living in that community at the time. We lived on a dirt road in a little shotgun house. And I, on one occasion in 1965, had a life changing experience. Uh, we were visited by a woman talking about a new government program that President Johnson was instituting that summer called Head Start. So I was very lucky to be in the inaugural class of Head Start in Ames, Texas in 1965. Uh, tell me a bit about your parents and the influence that they had on you as a boy and, and the ways that they've continued to shape your life today. Well, I never knew my father, so I can't really 
uh, opine on him, but I can certainly say, knowing my mother very well over uh, all these years, that she uh, left um, an indelible mark on my life because she uh, was supportive of me in every way, although she didn't have the means to always um, provide for luxury. Uh, we were never poor in my mind. Uh, we uh, always um, felt like we um, had what we needed. Uh, so I was lucky. I think uh, when I reflect on my work here at the Ford Foundation today, and I reflect on my work, what prepared me. When I was a 13-year-old boy, I got my first job. I was a busboy in a restaurant. And what I learned from that job, first, is about hierarchy. When you're the busboy, you and the dishwasher are the lowest of people uh, in the organizational hierarchy of a restaurant. And when you are the busboy, your job is to, first and foremost, be invisible. To go around the room and as discreetly and quietly as possible, take away the things that other people discard. The things that people reject and don't want. And you're to do that without in any way um, being visible. And often to the guests, I was invisible. I wasn't acknowledged. I wasn't necessarily extended any real dignity or recognition for the fact that I was a human being standing in front of someone. And when I think about the problems of the world today and our work at Ford, I think about what it feels like to be invisible to feel that others don't see your own humanity and others certainly don't extend dignity to you. There are too many people in the world today who feel this way. And our work at Ford is to ensure that as many people as possible in the world experience dignity. But you've discussed before the fact that growing up, uh, several of your cousins ended up entangled in the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how it shaped your understanding of yourself and the world around you. Well, there's no doubt that um, as a boy growing up, I um, had wonderful experiences with my cousins. Um, I recall playing um, in open yards with them. I recall um, just doing the things that young boys and girls do with their cousins and siblings, especially if you're a uh, big family and uh, in small towns. But I also remember the divergence in our journeys um, because I didn't live in the towns where they lived in Louisiana. Um, and I had a very um, engaged mother in my life. Um, I saw what happened in their communities. I saw um, the widespread um, seeming um, being swept up in a system, um, a system that uh, had low expectations for them, a system that provided very uh, weak uh, educational opportunities and very little, if any, economic opportunity. So there's no um, avoiding the fact that by the time I was a young adult, my journey and the journey of so many of my cousins, for example, uh, diverged significantly. Uh, I was in college and many of them were in prison. Um, and that is very uh, painful because um, they were as talented as I. They, I think, with the right support could have also been in college and not in prison. Um, but I believe they also got caught up in systems, systems and structures that were designed with race in mind and race and class 
uh, geography intersected in their lives in ways that uh, made it very, very difficult for them to advance. What did you learn about mortality that stuck with you? I think one of the things you learn as a child when you experience trauma is you begin to master compartmentalization. Compartmentalizing is a critical ingredient to success if one is to stay focused and um, clear in your aspirations, your ambitions, and your goals in life. Um, and I absolutely uh, learned that as a young child, and it's something for good and bad <laughs> that as an adult I realized uh, I know a lot about. Do you ever experience fear as a child? Has, has fear played a role in your life? Um, I never experienced fear. Uh, there was no doubt there were times I experienced physical fear, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but um, I was always um, clear that I wanted to, to do better. Uh, I was motivated more by a desire to please than I was by fear, if I'm to be honest. Um, the, um, one of the things that you learn as a child is um, when you do something um, good or that is perceived as a positive, it pleases your parents, it pleases your family. And one of the things that um, kids like me learned early on was how to please our parents. You pleased your parents when you did well in school. You please, uh, I please my mom when she'd go to the beauty parlor and someone would say, I saw Darren and he won this award or this very positive thing happened. Well, she glowed with pride. So I think I was more um, motivated by, by that than I was a fear of, of anything. Were there any events in your early life that required you to show courage? And, and what do you see uh, the role of courageousness uh, in your life and work today? Well, there's no doubt that courage is in short supply today. And that's in part because courageous leadership is not always rewarded. Indeed, many of our leaders are discouraged from being courageous because the consequences of courageous leadership can be ending of a career, can be uh, public scorn or ridicule, loss of status, loss of job. To be courageous today uh, requires uh, a sense of uh, self-awareness um, and purpose uh, and a willingness to live with the consequences. As a child growing up, there were absolutely times when I felt it was important uh, to be courageous, to take a side, um, to um, do something that um, would not necessarily be popular with either side or I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, I can think about times when um, it was important to build bridges, to build bridges between the white students in my high school and the black students in my high school, who at times were at odds. I always felt that my role was to be a bridge builder, was to not benefit from the division in our uh, school, uh, but to see the possibility that could come from our coming together. And, and for me, I think about today um, leaders who are disincented from doing that, who are indeed incented and encouraged and rewarded for dividing us, rewarded for not building bridges, but building walls. 
And I don't see that as courageous. I see that as um, the easy way out. I don't see that as courageous leadership. I mean, I just think we need more of it. So you grew up without a whole lot materially, but one thing that seems to have really dramatically changed the circumstances of your life, as you mentioned, uh, was the support of good old-fashioned government programs. Uh, how did benefiting from those programs inform you, and how did we get to a place where that vision of America seems so distant now? Well, I was very lucky to grow up in a country that believed in me. And the way a country commits itself to its people, in part, is committing itself to the potential of the human capital in its society, especially that human capital that has historically not been able to be fully realized, the potential to be fully realized. And so the Head Start program, public schools, the Pell Grant, um, private scholarships, all of these investments made it possible for me to get on the mobility escalator and ride it as far as my talent and my ambition could take me. And that is something I wish for every American. Unfortunately, too many people in this country believe that government is not serving their needs. That may be true, but it is also true that there has been an effort to discredit the idea of government, the very idea of the democratic institutions that, it, that makes it possible for our democracy to thrive. So we have to take that on. We have to acknowledge the threat posed by those who would seek to destroy the institutions that our democracy relies on. And that is why investing in hope is so important. Hope is the oxygen of democracy. When we have more hope, we will have a better democracy. But in order to generate hope, people have to believe in something. Part of what they have to believe in, in a democracy, is in their actual government. Um, and I think what we are seeing today in America is a contestation of the idea of government. My hope is that democracy wins. After law school, you moved to New York City where you dabble in law and then finance for a while. You said that no small reason you took those jobs was financial security, but when did you come to realize that you wanted something more out of your professional life, uh, that you wanted to make not only a dollar but a difference? I always knew that my life's journey would not be in the for-profit world. Uh, for me, uh, I was aware from the beginning that my time um, on Wall Street, for example, uh, had an expiration date that I would not be uh, happy simply uh, waiting for the bonus each year and uh, piling up money. Um, and so for that reason, I was always engaged outside of work in the community. It's how I first became uh, involved in Harlem because I volunteered at the Children's Storefront School up on 129th Street while I was working as, as a banker at UBS. And ultimately, the pull of Harlem, uh, the uh, chance to do work that was really meaningful to me um, became um, compelling. Um, and I, after a few years, made the jump. And I never looked back. I've never been happier. I certainly never regretted leaving Wall Street. So fast forward to 2013 and you're named the president of Ford. Was that daunting, thrilling? How did you begin to settle into the role and set your priorities? 
Well, it was a huge, um, thrilling moment for me. In some ways, it was like coming home. So many of the investments that were made in me, the Pell Grant, um, Head Start, or programs of the Ford Foundations. They were pilot programs of the Ford Foundation in the 1960s. Um, I worked for a community development corporation, which was also a creation of the Ford Foundation. And so when I came to Ford, in some ways, it felt like coming home. Um, this institution is a remarkable place with uh, unparalleled heritage in the area of social change, uh, social uh, progress, and human achievement. And to have the privilege of serving this institution um, was something I could never have imagined. Um, and so I, I was humbled, and every day I am humbled and challenged to rise to uh, the opportunity and the expectation of service. What have been some of the toughest choices you've had to make at Ford? And uh, on the flip side, what have been some of your proudest moments here? I think some of the most difficult choices are the programs that you decide to wind down. I mean, there are things that the Ford Foundation supported for many years that we started uh, to wind down. Our work in K through 12 public education is probably the most prominent example. Ford, for decades, had been a leader in funding um, K through 12 education reform in America. But over time, our investments and our impact became limited. And we took the time in 2013 to review our work and those investments and came to the determination that we weren't having the kind of impact that we desired and that there were other foundations who had come into uh, the space and were indeed having more impact and investing more. So we made the decision to bring that work to a close. It was very controversial. Um, it remains controversial to this day, in part because people understand that public education is a critical ingredient to uh, mobility opportunities for uh, low to moderate income, uh, urban and rural uh, Americans. We recognize that too, but for us that wasn't the question. The question for us was, what are the best and highest uses of our philanthropic dollar for social change? And so we took some of those um, funds and invested them in criminal justice reform, in addressing issues of misinformation and disinformation in this new digital era uh, where there was very little foundation funding, and yet the impact the harm that could be done to our democracy and to our education systems were real. It's more than okay, obviously, if you'd rather not talk about this, but I'd be remiss not to ask you about David. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit about him and, and your relationship and how he changed your life. Well, uh, David Beitzel came into my life uh, almost 30 years ago. He was a remarkable man from a very different background, very different uh, personality, um, but a person of remarkable integrity and character. He taught me about everything I know in the arts, especially um, the visual arts. Um, David taught me um, what love looks like. I didn't really know what love looked like or felt like until I met David Beitzel. And um, his um, death um, was sudden and um, I um, every day miss him and um, 
the grief that I feel I know is a function of the love I had for him. And um, I'm lucky though, because David Beitzel gave me enough love to last a lifetime. And when you're lucky enough to have that happen to you, you live every day with gratitude. The tragedy of his death was so senseless and was so unexpected. How did you push forward after that? The good news is when you um, are healing from that kind of profound loss, there are things that make it possible to heal. And for me, I had the full checklist of those things. First, family. David's family and I um, were and are very close. Um, second is the state of your relationship with him when he died. I was very lucky because David loved me so much, literally until his last breath, and I felt that. Um, I was lucky because I had friends, and I was lucky because I had a fantastic, meaningful career, not just a career, but a calling. And so the healing process for me um, has been, all things considered, relatively easy because I didn't have a lot of the demons and things that are suppressed and that uh, leave you wishing you had uh, done something different. Um, I know David knew how much I loved him and I felt that from him. And so I don't have any regrets, which is another way that allows for healing. Um, and so uh, while um, I know that um, my life will never be the same, because it won't and it hasn't been since he died, um, I also know that I am incredibly lucky, incredibly fortunate and blessed, and I feel that every day. You obviously gained a great deal of wisdom during your life and work. I'm wondering if there's one lesson or observation that you've learned above all others. Hmm. I think the lesson for me is something that I was taught about um, being gracious and generous. I was told this at a very young age, and it's been something that has stayed with me as a guiding principle, a North Star, for my own comportment and for the moments when um, I find myself feeling angry or selfish or egotistical or self-centered or indifferent, I'm reminded that people who live uh, with those qualities are not happy people. And I, I know because it's so true, grace and generosity are critical to happiness in life. I find that I am happier when I extend grace and generosity to others. And when I don't let the negative things crowd that out. Um, and it's so easy today to let those negative thoughts crowd out the goodness, uh, the light. It's so easy during these dark times to let the darkness overtake your psyche, your emotions. Um, but I always go back to the two G's. Um, and I don't mean Gucci, Noah. You've often returned to the theme of democracy. Uh, I'm wondering what is so central, why, why is that so central to your work here at Ford and what is its power and importance? Well, Henry Ford II 
reimagine the Ford Foundation's mission in the 1950s. In part, it was restated to focus on strengthening democracy and democratic practice. Democracy, in my view, is the greatest way a society can be organized. It is the greatest aspiration of a people. In the United States, democracy is even more rare because our aspiration is to have a multiracial, pluralistic democracy that may not have been the idea of our founding fathers, but they indeed did create the mechanisms, the legal foundations for a multiracial, pluralistic democracy. And I believe that experiment is worth fighting for. And at the Ford Foundation, that is what we do. We are freedom fighters for democracy because we believe that democracy is our future and that it is worth fighting for, but that we cannot take it for granted, that we cannot presume that it will exist merely because we wish it to. We have to invest in democracy, in democratic institutions, and in ensuring that everyone participates. Democracy cannot uh, be parsed out. Um, it can't be rationed. It must be available for everyone. And we believe this is our work. So lastly, you're 62 years old now. Does time seem to be passing by quickly for you? Are you enjoying the process of getting older? Well, no one wants to get older. Let's be clear. None of us wants to get older. I think the question is, can we, as we get older, embrace uh, the pleasures, the privilege of getting older, but recognizing that uh, our time is running out and therefore asking ourselves, what am I doing with the time I have left? What am I doing with the privilege that I've accreted over these years? Uh, what am I doing with the influence, the money, the access to power and networks? What am I doing to leverage that to help others? So for me, one of the privileges of being 62, being the president of the Ford Foundation, is that it gives me access access that I would otherwise not have. My job is to use that access, to use those networks, to remind people of what's important, or at least what I think is important, what we think here at the Ford Foundation is important, and that is working for a more just, fair, and equitable society.